Um, I appreciate. This is a long work, especially in, uh, it, well, it's a long work in any form. It's an extraordinary work in its complete form. It's a considerable work to get through in excerpted form. And being in excerpts, we're also kind of swimming upstream of continuity. Stuff that the full novel can stitch together and make coherent is much harder to follow when you're suddenly skipping, uh, you know, 20 chapters. Ah, sure. And you get like a little blurb at best telling you what happened in those chapters. But it's the stuff other than the plot description that honestly makes a, uh, a masterpiece what it is, as far as I'm concerned. So we can focus in, on a lot of big, uh, big picture things with this, but that will necessarily be very flawed because we're not dealing with the whole work. Um, it's a it's a magnificent piece of work that you can spend an awful lot of time on. And I encourage everyone to do so, but we are not going to in its macro form. When I read a novel, I don't know about you, but I do tend to get uh, bored at certain parts and I'll skim and I'll start flipping pages and like, yeah, let's go around and see what, what's interesting here. It's not unique to me, I'm sure. Um, we tend to zero in on what is the story, what's the plot, and we'll scan through and look for the names of major characters that we know we're supposed to be following and see, well, you know, when are they going to do something? They keep talking about this flower, you know, but when are they actually going to do something? Um, we're driven by that goal of getting to the end of the book and putting that little check next to it in our mind, saying, okay, finished. But that sort of approach tends to miss an awful lot. That sort of approach tends to miss uh, everything that really makes literature, but really all art, special. Little moments that often have a debatable connection to the overall plot of a story. Um, those can often be more significant and more um, impactful than the big plot developments and resolution at the end and the arc of the characters and stuff like that. Little moments. When you're watching a movie, very frequently, I would guess, you're going along, you're following the plot, you're following the plot, and then, you know, there are little scenes, quiet scenes that the filmmaker will put in there to sort of pace it out a little bit. You can't have one big action sequence followed by another. You need to have a little filler material in there where things just sort of calm down a little bit before they get ramped back up. Uh, it's those little moments that I find most interesting. It's, it's those little connective tissue parts that often hold some real, really significant points. When things quiet down on the page, that's when I tend to lean in more. The plot itself, yeah, it's going to go and you're going to hear a story. And in this case, you're going to hear a story of Genji. And you, we start out with his parents and their sad story, and then we follow him through a very long life, and then eventually he dies, and there's still hundreds of pages left, but we're following his descendants. And it does all tie together in that um, superstructure. But it's the little passages that I find most significant, and I want to take a look at a couple, because they really give a sense of... Um, how we read and what reading can be. And for a strictly uh, opportunistic way of reading, this is also how you can not read 
an entire work that has been assigned to you and perhaps still pull together a coherent chunk of an essay. Um, I know that's not the case with anyone here, but I'm just saying if in the future you have to take another class like this, this might be an approach you should consider. Uh, I'm going to look first on page 1345. Um, this is my fourth edition. For anybody with a different one, this is chapter, it's the section from chapter 13 titled Akashi, the lady at Akashi. Um, and at this point in the plot, Genji is older and uh, he's been uh, exiled from the capital and things are not going so well for the Shining Prince. Seems that his behavior pisses, pissed off the wrong people and he had to go away for a little while. The context is important, but I don't want to dwell on it. What I want to look at is, on my page 1345, um, it's like the, uh, the second paragraph down. At last, a messenger arrived from the Nijo Villa. The man who had rashly braved the weather was soaked to the point of looking weird and unearthly. He was also a very humble station. Had Genji passed such a person on the road at an earlier point in his life, he would not have recognized him as human and would have had his servants brush him aside. The fact that Genji now felt a deep kinship with such a man brought home just how far he had come down in the world and how much his self-esteem had collapsed. The man carried a letter from Murasaki. And then a short letter. Uh, this is a completely unexceptional paragraph by any definition. It's just sort of setting a scene. This messenger shows up and delivers a letter. Um, that's really all it communicates on, well, as essential to the plot. At this point in the plot, Genji needs to hear, uh, get in touch back, for, uh, get in touch with the people back in the court from which he has been exiled, and this dramatizes how far he is from it, how removed he is, how much he wants to go home, blah 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 blah. It's very easy to execute that as a writer, you know. Genji was sitting around one day, a messenger showed up with a letter. He read the letter. I just said that in like three sentences, and they were fairly short, stupid sentences. Here we've got not a long paragraph, but a lot more going on. Why? If I were editing this, and I am a terrible editor, I would say, Miss Shikibu, your book is 1,300 pages. Do we really need to have this many words to say a messenger showed up delivering a letter? It's what messengers do. Do you even need them? Can't you just say the mail came? What's that? Uh, I, was, I was just thinking that it just added a lot more to Genji's state. Yeah. And also, translation. Translation is always going to be a factor, and we have to respect that. Uh, medieval Japanese uh, is very different than English, and this book in particular has a very long and convoluted history of translation into uh, English. There have been only a few attempt, attempts to do it in, uh, in, in its entirety, and they're all very different in many different respects. You know, some uh, some are 
translation is a complicated business. Sometimes you're translating too much, and it comes off as just, you know, okay, you know, leave a little uh, left for the imagination. Sometimes you're translating too little, and it's too foreign and unapproachable and enigmatic, and Western readers don't know how to approach it. That is always baked into that, and we have to, everything we say is qualified by that, but still, we need to move forward with what we have here. But what you're saying is right, it does give you a lot of detail about Genji's state of mind, his attitude, his position, his frustration, it says very specifically, you know, um, how far, uh, how just, it brought home just how far he had come down in the world. Like, yeah, okay. Uh, any word from home, when you remember home being this spectacular palace, and now you're living out in the middle of nowhere with, you know, only a dozen or so servants in a relatively small palace surrounded by, you know, just trees and fields as opposed to the great capital city, uh, it is a humbling experience. And this is reminding him of that because it's pointing out the distance between where he is and where he really wants to be. So it is conveying that, but it's doing more than that. What do we think of the messenger? Is he just a guy who shows up and hands over a letter? Hmm? Look at how the treatment of him evolves just through grammar. And here we're treading, as James suggested, very hard on the edges of uh, uh, translation issues. But I'm going to trust that this translator is respecting the basics of the original in the way that this is translated in very specific terms. Um, at last, a messenger arrived from the Nijo Villa. What is the subject of this sentence? The messenger. Grammatically speaking, the messenger is the subject. The messenger arrived. Arrived is the verb. Language is built out of nouns and verbs. There are any number of nouns and verbs that could be used to communicate what needs to happen here? This author is choosing these. At last, a messenger arrived from his Nijo villa. The man who had rashly braved the weather was soaked to the point of looking weird and unearthly. Uh, if this guy's whole purpose in the narrative is just to show up and hand over a letter, again, I come back to the question, why couldn't Morisaki Shikibu just write, a messenger showed up with a letter. And then the next line is, Genji tore it open in anticipation and read it. Or something like that. Why do we need to know that the man who had rashly braved the weather was soaked to the point of looking weird and unearthly? What is the subject of that sentence, grammatically speaking? Man! Yeah! Very good! The man! So he's a messenger and he is a man. He is driving the action. He has the verb. The man ha was soaked to the point, was soaked, is essentially the verb, was is the verb, was soaked to the point of looking weird and unearthly. So he is driving the action, quite literally. He is the subject of these first two sentences, and he has agency. He is performing the verbs. He is in control of this sentence, of these two sentences. Plus, what do we know about him at this point after two short sentences? He looks like hell, yeah. He is uh, wet. He has been riding all night through a storm to deliver this message. 
this message that turns out to be fairly short and, uh, you know, I'm not going to say inconsequential, but it's not, you know, it's not uh, your father's on his deathbed and you must go home immediately type important. This is, you know, uh, a fairly anodyne little note. But the man who had rashly braved the weather, rashly braved, what does that tell us? What does rashly mean? Rashly. To do something rashly is to do something impetuously, to do something to brave danger, to charge out into a rainy, stormy, dark, and dangerous night when maybe people would have understood perfectly well if you didn't and just said, you know, it's crappy out right now. I'm going to stay in tonight. I will get an early start tomorrow. It might still be raining, but it at least will be daylight, and I can take this message then. Rashly. Why do we need to know that he did something rashly? This is now an adverb. Why do we need to know how he did anything? What does this tell you about him? Well, I think we just covered that. But what does this tell you about his place? April. Maybe he doesn't have a choice. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, if you're a messenger, chances are you're not really high in the administration. You're not a boss. You're probably not even the head messenger if you're the one getting sent out in the, in the rain. Um, he is a fairly low-level employee of this imperial court. I think we can safely say that. He's not given a name. We have no dignity of a name here. Characters who get named are always more important than those who don't. But what do we, how are we, how is he identified? The messenger or the man? The man. It starts as the messenger. They could have stuck with that. Here, it switches immediately to the man. It grants him the dignity of humanity. Right? That's what this does. Simple, subtle switch, but deliberate. The man who had rashly braved. April. How so? Yeah, he's, uh, Genji's relationship to this man, this messenger, is kind of encapsulated in very tight form in this paragraph. And you can see some of the same problems that have gotten him where he is. He has always been a little bit, uh, everybody loves him, everybody admires him, he is the shining Genji, but... He's, uh, he's got what, you know, used to be called a bit of a zipper problem. He tends to chase everything in a skirt. Fair to say. Um, his behavior is less impressive. So he's had some room to grow as a human being. And here we see his relationship to other human beings sort of isolated in a very short, tight scene. But notice that third sentence. And grammatically, again, what that does. 
he was also a very humble person. So he, a pronoun, is still in control, is still the subject of the sentence. The, the focus of this sentence, the spotlight of this narrative is still on the messenger, the man, the human being. But now he's just a pronoun, he. He was also a very humble, of very humble station. Had Genji passed such a person on the road and at an earlier point in his life, he, and now that he is refer, referring to Genji, Genji is taking over control of the sentence, taking over the focus, the spotlight. He would not have recognized him as a human and would, and would have had his servants brush him Again, now the, uh, the pronoun is shifting off to, he's pushing the, uh, the messenger into the object position of the sentence grammatically. Genji is taking over control. The focus is all on him, not on the man. Brushed him aside. The fact that Genji now felt a deep kinship with such a man brought home just how far he had come down in the world and how much his self-esteem had collapsed. Genji opens the door. Well, he doesn't. Somebody comes to his door, and Genji greets this man who is carrying a message. This man, we're told he is a man. He is emphasized. He is a man. He gets the dignity of humanity. We're told he is soaked to the skin. He had rashly, meaning with some courage, maybe even some desperation, had rashly ridden out to deliver this message in the middle of the night. We get a sense of his personality. We get a sense of his motivations, perhaps, even. His drive, his determination, perhaps, to rise up in the world. Maybe to be the next level messenger who doesn't go out in the middle of the night in the rain. You get a sense of a person there. But how does Genji see him? as something unearthly, as something alien, as something not recognized as human. Genji is objectifying this person and distancing him, diminishing him. This brave person who ran out in the middle of the night to do his job is nothing more than something that's, you know, you know you're you're, you're dripping on my floor. Would you mind just, you know, stepping back outside? There's, there's a mat out there. You can drip on that. Looking weird and unearthly. Completely dehumanized. No longer a man in Genji's eyes. Genji cannot recognize the humanity of this person. Cannot recognize other people for their feelings. As he is running around having all of these love affairs, uh, does he love all of these women? Maybe? Probably not. Does he really love his dad while he is sleeping with his stepmother? I don't know about that. That's a tough one to argue. He's being confronted right here with how he treats other human beings, with how he sees them, with how he dismisses them. And it's happening in very tight form. It's happening grammatically, it's happening dramatically. The fact that Genji now felt a deep kinship with such a man brought home just how far down, just how far he had come down in the world. The fact that he saw this poor schlub Cold, wet, tired, probably breathing hard from doing an awful lot of running in the dark to deliver this inconsequential little message to Genji. And Genji's response is, well, you know, you really make me feel bad about where I am right now because you're suffering, but so am I, and I'm going to dwell on that. Yeah, I've got it rough. Well, I think he does because... Anybody that's come down from a 
higher social class or something. You know, lived in a higher social class or was born like him to a higher social class and then come down. I think it's more detrimental to, to a person that's already been there. Yeah. But you know what we're doing when we're talking about that? We're talking about class. We're talking about the natural um, desire to rise up and stay up in a class system. Um, what do aristocrats and the people on the top of any class system generally not want to have to talk about? Not have anyone question. Why they're there. Yeah, why they're there. Bringing up that subject is kind of awkward, especially, you know, with regard to some of the people who are on the lower end of the totem pole. Murasaki Shikibu knows this. She can write anything. Again, she could have written, the mail came. But she crafted this little paragraph, this tiny little scene with so much going on in just a couple of lines to stick it in there and have a mini drama within this overall drama. Will you remember this tiny paragraph by the time you get to page 1300 of the full novel? Probably not. But it's a grain of sand. It's one little item that you went through and colored the way you're seeing the rest of the book. Because she reminds you constantly to look at the real dynamic. Once you get past all of that shining Genji propaganda, you start taking a more objective look. He's kind of a jerk. April. Sure. He's beautiful. Everybody talks about that above everything else. He is uh, on, he is empowered, he is entitled, he is all of those things. He is very rich, the son of the emperor, the favorite son of the emperor. But what does that mean? Now think back from the very beginning. His whole uh, existence already kind of creates that tension of violates the clear logic of aristocracy because everybody is always committing or commenting rather in the beginning chapters that we saw of wow look at him he is perfect in every way he is an emperor that's what a king looks like damn it but he's not and he can't be because of his birth But what does that say about the people who are emperors that aren't as perfect? Well, isn't it just an accident of birth? Everybody looks at him and says, that's what a king should be. That is that kind of impressive image of a king. Of course the system makes sense if that person is on top, but he's not. He's not on top. He has a brother who will be the emperor. Genji is made a commoner because he has this troubled background. His heritage is imperfect. So from that very beginning, from Genji's birth, and arguably conception before that, she was stirring the pot and getting people to look at what we have here. Look at our system. It makes no sense. It keeps people down when they are perhaps better than the people who are up. And think of the courage it takes her to say that when she is writing it for the Empress. She is writing this not for general consumption. Anybody can play to the mass crowd. 
she is writing this for the wife of the emperor, the royal court, who are on the top of that pyramid. But you know what? I'll bet a lot of them who are reading it, and they're sitting around in the empress's rooms, enjoying life, I'll bet they look at the empress from time to time, say, you know, I'm better than her. And that husband of hers, the emperor, just between you and me, is really not at all that bright. I saw him walk into a door the other day. She can't say that explicitly, but if she can bury it, one tiny little paragraph, a grain of sand in an ocean of words, that can have an effect. That's just one little, what is going on there? What? Huh. That's trouble. And over time, those grains of sand tend to accumulate. And pretty soon it's not an ocean, it's a desert. Because that's all you see are these tiny grains of sand. Um, also, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't point out that uh, what is he delivering? The messenger? A letter. And what happens immediately after? What's the next words after uh, that, that paragraph? The man carried a letter from Murasaki. And then they read the letter. So immediately, we are told that there is an emphasis on reading. Again, we could have gotten this and said, uh, Genji got a note from, uh, from the palace, from Murasaki, and it said this. But instead, we're explicitly told that reading happens right then and there. Now, letters are all over this book. People are constantly exchanging letters. And that's kind of what you did in, you know, the ancient world. We didn't have texting. But just think about how much texting goes on now, people writing out letters. But we're told explicitly following this to consider the act of reading. Consider the act of interpretation. It's not all on the surface. You should read between the lines to understand what's going on. And everything I just talked about was reading between the lines. I'm pointing out that certain word choices might mean one thing or the other, but probably means one thing. But this is all me reading between the lines, because I would be willing to bet that not too many people in this room could read it that same way before I started pointing it out. Because that is a totally skimmable paragraph. But when you read between the lines, when you're told explicitly, do some reading here, this is a letter, this is something that needs to be interpreted, when that happens, then you have to pump the brakes a little and say, well, gee, what is going on here, really? Let's take another look. Um, on the subject of reading, I'm going to flip to page 1360. Here we have Genji comes across a room full of women reading. So ding, 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 reading. What could that alert me to? And here we see a side of Genji that you see intermittently throughout, but it really becomes quite acute because you really get a sense of uh, jackassitude, to coin a phrase. He comes across women reading, reading tales specifically, stories. You know, everybody likes a good story. They're reading stories. You know, it's like coming across a book club of women reading trashy novels or something like that. And he has the attitude that I just sort of slipped in there. A little condescending. Oh, isn't that good? You, you ladies are, you know, reading this stuff. Oh, that's, that's, that's nice. That's, you're reading tales, huh? Tales are, uh, that, that's women's stuff. Real men, as we've say, seen before, real men do poetry. I'm sorry. Poetry is for real men. 
Poetry is written in Chinese, not Japanese. Poetry is highly rigorous and very logical in its structure. And when you get rid of all the poetic structure and when you start talking about it in just vernacular Japanese, well, it's, it's, it's less impressive. Anybody can read that. You have to be educated to read Chinese poetry. So, you know, you, you, you ladies, you got your, your, your uh, this is 10th century chiclet. That's good for you. Um, it just drips in condescension. On page uh, 1360, Genji couldn't avoid seeing these illustrated tales which were left scattered all around Tamakazura's quarters. Ah, oh, how tedious. <laughs> how tedious, he chided. Women are by nature blithely content to allow others to deceive them. You know full well these tales have only the slightest connection to reality, and yet you let your heart be, be moved by such trivial words and get so caught up in their plots that you, co that you copy them out without, a, without giving a thought to the tangled mess your hair has become in this humid weather. <laughs> um, now here I've just got a single out. Uh, you're a little bit outvoted here. But ladies, if somebody said this to you, what are you worrying about all of the schoolwork for? What are you worrying about all the reading and the thought and all that stuff? Why don't you just focus on being pretty? What's the reaction? Somebody's going to get their ass kicked. Okay. Uh, probably more in the modern age than then, but I'd, be, but I'd be willing to bet that this happens on a moment-to-moment -moment basis today. Open up Twitter and somebody says something and you see this sort of fury get unleashed. But, again, this is all about reading. Signaling that you need to read between the lines. Genji is uh, downplaying the importance of what they're doing. He is condescending to their ability to keep up with, you know, male, macho, masculine uh, uh, disciplines. And he's, uh, he gets into a little bit of an argument with um, Tamakazura, who is effectively his niece. She is the daughter of Tono Chujo, who is his brother-in-law. And um, I believe at this point, uh, the details of the story get a little past me sometimes. Uh, uh, Tono Chujo has died. And uh, uh, Tamakazura has come to live with Genji as a kind of uh, uh, as a kind of father. Um, but Genji, being Genji, starts to take a more than fatherly interest in the young lady, and here it starts to get really oozy. Uh, Tamakazura has an attitude. Tamakazura doesn't like being spoken down to. Tamakazura shot back in this translation. There is certainly no doubt that someone practiced at lying, i.e. you, you scumbag, would be inclined to draw such a, such a conclusion for all sorts of reasons. I remain convinced, however, that these stories are quite truthful. So here she's demonstrating an interpretive value for literature. Literature is truthful in a way, but you have to read between the lines. She pushed her inkstone away. Why include that? She, uh, it's earlier, or it's obvious, made obvious earlier that she has been drawing figures or sketching or writing. Uh, she pushed her inkstone away. But why mention that detail there? Again, the poor editor in me would go, Miss Shik, Miss Sh uh, Miss Shik, <laughs> totally blank here. 
Miss Shakubi, 1,300 pages. We don't need to know that she pushed the inkstone away. What's the purpose of that? Scratch it out. Let's tighten up this monster. But she puts it in there because an inkstone is what has ink in it, and ink is what you use to write. Tamakazura is being associated with a writer at this point. She is the voice of a woman, a woman writer. Who else is a woman writer? Morisaki Shikibu. She is finding a way to put her own voice in there, and she is shooting down the voice of all the men she's ever heard in her life tell her, oh, come on. Don't give me all this chick stuff. Reading and writing and literature, that's for men. You worry about your hair. Could she do that outside of a character's voice? Could she do that in real life? Probably not. But by pushing it into the voice of a character, all she has to say is, well, that's just, you know, it's my imagination. You can interpret it however you want, but this is just what the character says. She pushed the inkstone away. Genji starts backtracking and suggesting that, well, you know, in certain respects, you know, literature is important and stories are important. They, they teach us a lot about history and they can do this and they can do that. And, and he slowly uh, undercuts his original position. As a debater, Genji sucks. He came up with one point, got a little pushback on it, and then slowly gave all that ground up to say the exact opposite. In the end, the correct view of the matter is that nothing is worthless, he said. Genji was now claiming that tales were beneficial, which means he completely capitulated. Uh, Shining Genji isn't necessarily too bright. This girl just took him to the cleaners. But look what he does then. And again, ladies, tell me if this behavior pattern looks familiar. He has been defeated in front of others. There are other people in the room who are watching this conversation, watching this drama unfold. And he says, now that he has been completely defeated in the debate, uh, tell me then, he concluded, have you found any stories of piously foolish men like me among your old scrolls? Hmm. There couldn't possibly be any fictional princesses in the world who are so extremely aloof and heartless as you. Okay. Who pretend not to notice anything. You can just hear his eyebrow arching in this. So how about it? Shall we make a story? Unlike any other that has ever been told and pass it on to a later generation. What's going on here? What's Genji doing? It's not that different in medieval Japan as it is today. This is a Me Too moment. He's hitting on her. It is sleazy. It was sleazy then, it is sleazy now. It's even more so when you consider that he is much older than her at this point, than she is, and he is supposed to be her father figure. He is her uncle. The daughter of his best friend, supposedly. It's sleazy. It's kind of the behavior that we have seen played throughout, the serial womanizer, but that never really gets explicitly condemned. We are left to make this judgment on our own. The Shining Genji, oh, he's so perfect, but he's kind of a sleaze. And here it is a kind of leering revulsion that comes about. 
but still isn't necessarily called out explicitly by the author, but Tama Kazura pushes back against it because she's not having any of it. Genji sidled over to her. Sidled is a great word. I'm not sure what the original would be, but the fact that they went to sidled suggests that, you know, this is meant to be sleazy. Tama Kazura turned away from him, hiding her face in her collar. Hiding her face in her collar. How many screens have we seen in this story? How many fans hiding a face? How many doors? How many, how many barriers do we see? Secrets behind which they hide. And said, even if we don't make a story together, the relationship we do have is so bizarre and unbelievable that it will likely never become the subject of court gossip. So, look what she has done here. He has taken this little uh, sexual urge that he is feeling, and he puts it into a kind of uh, rhetorical, poetic framework, saying, shall we make a story together, one that people will tell for generations? As pickup lines go, it's, it's pretty weak. But he couches his uh, overture to her as a kind of literature, as a kind of uh, epic tale. She takes that and turns it around on him. She bats it right back down. Tamakazura turned away from him, hiding her face in her collar, and said, even if we don't make a story together, he, she has taken that ball, and she is going to serve it right back in his face. The relationship we do have is so bizarre and unbelievable that it will likely never become the subject of court gossip. So she shuts down his little overture about it being sort of this grand romance that people will talk about and tell as a story for generations. And she makes it cheap and tawdry, like court gossip. But she does something more there. She shows that she can best him at his game. He was trying to be kind of poetic in a story that, or in a scene that's, that's rife with references to writing and to poetry and to composition and the value of literature. He's trying to make a poetic figure out of their relationship and make it seem like something, you know, a grand romance, something... Ooh, a little illicit. She takes that, lifts it up, spears it, and then stuffs it right back down in his face. She turns the tables on his court, which I'm totally mixing metaphors for. But she is smarter than he is, and she proves it here. The woman, and at this point she's still pretty young, so the younger person and the woman, proves better than Genji. Better morally, better logically, better rhetorically. She can out-argue him, she can outthink him, and I think it's fairly obvious that uh, she is a bit more moral person at this moment. Again, one little scene really easy to bypass, and it can say so much if you just look at it. One more. Page, I have my notes on here for this one. Uh, it begins on like 1383. Um, here, Genji has died. And the story is shifting to his uh, descendants. Some of the lines of uh, uh, family delineation get a little bit complicated. Uh, we don't need to dwell on that. I really don't care. That's plot stuff. <laughs> plot is fine, but who cares? Uh, here, we get the story of... Um, it's actually Genji's brother, uh, Prince Hachinomiya, and I will butcher that name from here on forward. Uh, Prince Hachinomiya uh, loses his wife after she gives birth to her second daughter, 
and uh, he spends the rest of his life raising the girls, but he misses his wife. He wants to go be a, uh, he wants to withdraw from the world with all its pains, renounce everything, and go be a monk. And he would do that, except he's got these two little girls. And it's just not cool to tell a couple of little girls, eh, life sucks, uh, I'm going to go live on a mountaintop, good luck. He's a better dad than that. But over time, he's drawn to that life, but he stays embedded in, uh, in his personal life with his daughters and trying to be a good dad and a good member of the community. And he's developing a reputation for a bit of a scholar because, you know, he is studying Buddhism. He's studying sacred texts and he's getting a reputation in his community and that reputation is starting to spread. So much so that eventually it begins to hit the capital and people start to hear rumors of this wise man off in the off in the woods, in the wilds, near a mountain or whatever. And one day, uh, I think it's Kauru, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, I'm terrible with pronunciation, I just don't care. Um, Kauru, who is one of Genji's descendants, uh, goes to visit him, says, you know, I've been hearing so much about this wise, wise man, uh, I want to come and, and learn from him. I have been feeling a little lost myself. He is someone who I feel uh, can give me some guidance. But of course he shows up and Hachi no Miya, again I'm going to butcher that, uh, is off on his mountain doing his prayers and, you know, doing the monk thing. So Kaoru is sitting there, well this kind of stinks, I should have called ahead, nobody's here, uh, but he hears, well, okay, uh, the prince's daughters are here, and they have, of course, reputations as the most graceful and brilliant young ladies of uh, the age, and of course, the most beautiful. So he says, all right, you know, maybe I'll, uh, I'll just hang out for a little while. I hear there are some good-looking young girls here, so, you know, uh, I don't want to get back on the road so quick. I'll stay, and I'll just hang out, and I'll entertain myself and relax for a little bit. But he doesn't want to be seen right away. How many times have we seen that? They don't want to be seen. They're going to eavesdrop on a conversation from behind a screen. So he does this, and he hears the girls talking. Um... Here, actually, I'm going to flip to uh, page 1386. Um, well, no, wait a minute. 1385. Uh, as they neared the villa, they heard a chillingly, they heard chillingly sublime music, though they could not tell what the instruments were. And Kaoru and his, uh, uh, his entourage are getting close to the, the room where the girls are playing music. Um, the instrument was tuned to the Oshiki mode, and though the song was an ordinary prelude used for tuning, it had a setting in an otherworldly feel. Uh, ordinary becoming otherworldly when you really listen. The sound produced by the plectrum was pure and enchanting. A 13-string koto could be heard accompanying the biwa intermittently, and its graceful feminine tone was deeply affecting. Feminine tone! Now, I know language very often has a masculine and feminine quality to it. I was unaware that music did feminine. The music is considered feminine. Who is playing it? Girls. Flipping the page, 1386. The girls are playing music. They're sitting around. They're having a conversation. The sisters were seated inside the aisle room. One of them was partially hidden behind a pillar. Partially hidden, once again. Always something obstructing. Always something shielding, masking, screening. A biwa lute was set out in front of her, and she was 
turning over the plectrum with her fingertips, toying with it. When the moon suddenly emerged, the moon is highly symbolic. When the moon suddenly emerged from behind a cloud and brightly lit up the scene, a sign of illumination, realization perhaps, she said, I may not have a fan, but I can still call forth the moon with this. The lovely glow of her face, which peeked out from behind the plectrum, was utterly adorable. Peeking out, again, always hidden. Uh, can she really control the moon with a musical instrument? Probably not. But she feels she can. And maybe on a certain metaphorical level, she can. The other sister, who was reclining nearby, was leaning over a koto. I've heard of people calling forth the setting sun, she said, but you are certainly prone to some peculiar notions. Now, if you look, there is a number there which puts a reference to a, uh, a poem or a dance or something. So they're citing uh, other works of art as they're chatting. This is a fairly high-level aesthetic discussion. And they're talking about art in a very abstract way. The power of art is the power to move the stars and the sky. This is a very sophisticated, high-level talk they're having. Very poetic. She was smiling and her figure seemed a little more dignified and modestly refined. Her figure, not her body, not, not something concrete, but her figure a more loose, superficial term. A figure can also be a figure of speech in English. It can be something poetic, something meant for interpretation, not obvious on the surface. The point is, and I'm not going to go crazy with this, but the point is, this guy comes and he's listening from behind a screen to these women have this very poetic conversation while weaving in references to other arts and other disciplines and they're playing music and it is very uh, sophisticated in its way. When it's over, he says, well, this was nice. I came for a conversation with the father to maybe give me some guidance, some comfort in this world through his role as a spiritual leader, but I, uh, I couldn't find him. He was unavailable to me. But I found his daughters instead. And just listening in on their conversation, just experiencing their art, their beauty, their genius, that, that, was, that was good enough. That was maybe even better. He says on page 1388, um, oh, where'd it go, where'd it go, where'd it go, where'd it go? Hold on, sorry, I think I, I lost my spot. Uh, oh yes, I came in at inconvenient time, he told the homely watchman, but as things turned out, my visit has given me joy and some small comfort for my cares. That's 1387. My visit has given me joy and some small comfort from my cares. He came for one thing. He came for religious guidance, couldn't find it. Instead, he found something that was accessible, and that was a conversation among two girls about art and the power of art. And he feels better. Maybe he didn't get the full effect of uh, what, his, what their father could have provided, but it was enough, and it was available to him, right there. The father was gone, they were there, talking about art. Now, 
boil that down a little. He experienced art and femininity, specifically a feminine art, explicitly told to be a feminine art. He experienced this and feels better. when the rigors of religion were not available to him. Art can be an accessible substitute for religion. Being an ascetic, being a monk, is a hard life, and not too many people can approach it. Hashimoto, or whatever his name is, he can't even manage it. He can only do it part-time. Kauru shows up hoping for some sort of spiritual uplift, some sort of solace from that man, and he can't find him. He can't get it either. But what can he find? Art and femininity. Value in art on a spiritual scale. The art itself produces a kind of comfort, solace, helps him pass the time on a lonely night when he's recovering. He's had a long journey and he just wants to relax, so he spends a little time listening to women speak about art, women engaging in and producing art, and he feels better at the end of it. He can't achieve the levels of religiosity and spiritualism that he has in his head that are held up to him as an ideal, but what he can find is the art. He can always pick up a book. And just read. Read a story. Connect to other people through art. Not something very abstract, not something too distant, not something too perfect and awe-inspiring, but something simple and approachable and human. And connect to other humans through that art. But it's a specifically feminine art. So yeah, he can just go home, go back to the capital and get on with his life and say, well, you know, yeah, I would really love to go visit the monk on the mountain again this weekend, but you know, it's, uh, I, I got a lot to do tomorrow. It's a full schedule and uh, there's only so many hours in the day. I could just flip open a book and start reading stories and feel a little solace, a little bit of comfort, a little bit of rejuvenation that way, or what else might be available? If not art, a woman, a woman's perspective. You can find solace as he did in a woman's perspective. A woman can give you a different spin on things. A woman can give you a different idea. Just the act of conversing, communicating, connecting with a woman will offer you all the solace you need to get through the day. And just like the book is on the nightstand, very often you wake up and the wife is right there. Maybe one of several wives, but right there. So here you have Murasaki Shikibu pointing out in somewhat oblique, opaque terms that all the religious vigor that people show, all the uh, dedication, devotion, self-flagellation, denial, abstention, renunciation, all of that might provide some solace, but if you just don't have that kind of calling or time, that same connection, that same spirituality, that same solace is available if you just look for it. And everything that we have been talking about is about looking in the unexpected places, 
reading between the lines. You can find the solace you seek in the person sitting next to you or in the book on the nightstand if you actually look for it. But if you don't, you won't find it. You'll be wandering around like Genji, trying one time after another after another to find a fulfilling connection that he can discipline himself to stick with. But he's forever seeking and finding perfect images that turn out to be human. And he doesn't want human. He wants perfect. He wants, well, if it looks perfect, it must be perfect on the inside too. But when you get close, less than perfect. Everything in this book is driving towards that point. Everything in this book is driving to that point of you can find everything you want to get through in life, but you have to dig for it. And you cannot take just the superficial judgment of what you see. It's very easy to pass over all of these sections, all of these little tiny snippets, all those little hints of words here and there. Why choose that word instead of this one? Because that is where the truth lies. That's where the themes come out in a way that the entire story doesn't really bring out. You can use the girth of this book, this enormous book, to hide lots of little things in there that really carry the message. While everything in the big picture sort of points to the shining Genji and he is perfect and we should all try and be like him and everything would be perfect if we just judge things like he does. But everything underneath, all the little moments that add up to that are really undercutting that judgment the entire time. And for Murasaki Shikibu's per perspective, and I don't like going into biography or anything, but when you are writing in an imperial system, in a rigidly hierarchical society where no dissent is going to be tolerated, you got to cover your bases a little bit. You have to make it a little bit obscure. You have to hide behind multiple screen after screen after screen that you can judge many different ways. She has plausible deniability for saying, I never meant to say that, you know, Genji was a jackass. I never meant to say that women are worth anything at all. Clearly, we're all just ditzes. She has crafted this so she can say that. But at the same time, anybody who reads it closely, reads between those lines, can see that is not her point at all. Reading is about many things. It's not about understanding everything. There's too much going on in this to really keep on top of everything. Reading is about trying to understand at least something. So you can turn the pages, read every word, and just say, all right, I got to finish this, I got to finish this, I got to finish this. And then at the end, you do get that satisfying feeling of, hey, yeah, I read that. Feels good. Check that little line off on your syllabus. Put that book back on the shelf. Yeah, done. I love completion. But really, it's about going through it and seeing the little moments, seeing what they add up to, puzzling with them, just coming across anything at random, opening it up and saying, why this way? Why does this happen? What would be different if I just changed it a little bit? What would be the effect? That's what reading is. That's what life is, because if you can do that, if you can sharpen your mind through this practice of just flipping at random through something and saying, well, you know, what's going on here? And trying to decode what has been so elaborately wrought in front of you. If you can do that, then you can do anything. 
because that is the skill of the 21st century. That is interpreting information in an information world. And that's why we always come back to these texts, because they are so much to dig into, so much to decode. This is not simple stuff. This is very rich stuff that we will never get to the bottom of, but we don't need to because it's just about sharpening our teeth.